population. So, you know, I'm going to put up some slides. They're, they're pretty busy, so we're just going to touch and go on them. <clears throat> but I wanted to bring up that top right <clears throat> corner, excuse me. You'll see a lot of the uh, diagnoses that our senior citizens may already suffer from. Alzheimer's, cancer, Parkinson's, ALS. <clears throat> Initially in 2015, medical cannabis was meant to uh, help people with intractable epilepsy, seizure disorder. You know, at the time it was hard to get it. The uh, ratio of the CBD oil with the THC, CBD and THC, as you may know, are the uh, active ingredients for medical cannabis, used to be very high, it had to be 20 to one. And then subsequently in 2019, uh, they loosened up what diagnoses we can use for medical cannabis and also the ability to increase the THC. And at that point, uh, it kind of, it, it, it went to the races, right? We, we, we were able to use medical cannabis, not just for uh, patients with seizure disorder, but then they started opening it up for people with autism, spasticity, neuropathy is a big one, Alzheimer's is a big one. And subsequently, we got involved because we wanted to help our hospice patients. So uh, Melissa Trevina and I opened up uh, Buena Vida Hospice uh, and then subsequently started using medical cannabis in our senior citizens and our, our hospice patients. And then what happened right before you guys joined, we, I was just talking briefly to Catherine, is in September 1st of this year, uh, that diagnosis um, list opened up to PTSD and also all cancers. So no longer did you have to be terminal. You could have a cancer, whether it Any was going to be cured or not. Well, when I open you up to being able to. Whether or not uh, you, you were uh, being treated for a terminal cancer, you ended up having uh, the ability to qualify for medical cannabis. And, uh, and so let's talk briefly about what qualifies you for medical cannabis. Those top, that top right corner where it says uh, epilepsy and then all the subsequent diagnoses are the big ones. I'm gonna show you a, a slide which is just overwhelmingly long with all the other things that you can qualify for. But most of the disease, these diseases we don't see very often. They're very rare. A lot of them are genetic. They're in bore errors or metabolism. Uh, dementia with Lewy bodies down here as well. Vascular dementia is hidden in here, but you'll see that the list goes on and on. Most of these diagnoses are neuro, neurologic, are degenerative, incurable neurological disorders. And, um, and, and what we find is that most people will qualify for the ones that you saw on that first slide, right? Uh, in regards to how we end up getting medical cannabis for patients um, here in Texas, you can't smoke it, you can't vape it. Uh, we are still anxiously waiting for hopefully the federal government to take medical, well, take cannabis off schedule one. Schedule one medications are those that uh, have, according to the government, no use, no use for research, no use for patient care. That includes, um, you know, ecstasy, medical can well, cannabis, cocaine, for example. What we hope is that once we move out schedule one, you're gonna be able to see the use, hopefully in Texas, of medical cannabis for things like generalized anxiety, chronic pain, two, two of the biggest ones that we've been trying to advocate for the Texas legislature to change. Um, let's go back down to those slides. Uh, really, uh, I'm just gonna give you just a quick primer on medical cannabis. Um, you know, obviously marijuana has been around since the beginning of time. Uh, it's been used in America since the 1600s. Uh, we concentrate in medicine, medical cannabis, uh, with the two main diagnose, I'm sorry, main ingredients, which are THC and CBD. You see them at the bottom of that slide. Those are the ones that are going to provide therapeutic effect, right? Uh, we uh, we just had a patient actually. I was talking to my director of nursing before we started the presentation because I'm here at the hospice office, and one of our patients who has a metastatic cancer is having poor appetite. And uh, well, we and he's in his late 80s. <clears throat> and one of the things we wanted to avoid was uh, to give him any more medications that can cause side effects. He's already on some that he can't tolerate. So we were discussing starting a THC medical cannabis for this uh, gentleman to increase his uh, appetite. Uh, that being said, that same THC will also be an anti-inflammatory. It'll help with his nausea. It'll help uh, stimulate his appetite, like I said and hopefully help them sleep. And what we found too is that 
with certain patients, <clears throat> just giving a THC isn't sufficient. You have to couple it with CBD. You know, CBD, which is what we hear all the news about, every corner has a CBD store, it, it seems now. Uh, this CBD is coupled with the THC in like a certain ratio. And when they're put together, they have this amplification effect. They work better together. Uh, and we found uh, success with our patients. I, I, would, I would think, I would wanna say about a 75 to 90% success rate when we start patients, our elderly patients on medical canvas. This is only talking on the hospice side, obviously. What we've also found is that the medical cannabis has been very successful in non-hospice patients, right? So more relevant perhaps to uh, our, our group of uh, people here at our conference is those patients that are not hospice appropriate, those patients that are not in the pipe, how do they benefit from medical cannabis? And we found that those that certainly you don't have to be in stage Parkinson's or dementia or Alzheimer's to qualify and take advantage of it. Uh, you don't have to be terminal cancer anymore. Uh, certainly PTSD is a big one. Uh, we found that a lot of our senior veterans have suffered from PTSD and were unable to get medical cannabis because they just were not allowed. A lot of, many of them were using it already illegally <clears throat> and they wanted to become legal, if you will. And what we found is that by offering a medical cannabis uh, as a substitute for the illegal, uh, they are much happier. They're able to use it. They know it helps. Uh, the PTSD in our veterans community is, is, is very high. Uh, that's one thing that I found out uh, starting September the 1st when it was uh, able to be used for PTSD that there's a great percentage of our veterans have PTSD. They're being treated with multiple medications. Many of those medications have pretty big side effects or they're ineffective or the patients don't want to be on traditional uh, pharmacological agents. So they want to do something that they consider and they feel is more natural. And this is one of the options that they have. Uh, let's go down to speaking of options and medication. See the next slide. So I did want to point out um, how safe medical cannabis is. You know, back in the 80s, and uh, when I was a child, you know, the war on drugs, we, we were always taught that medical cannabis was your, your gateway drug, right? We were always taught that if you started smoking marijuana, you were going to end up being a drug addict somewhere in the corner of some urban city, you know, because then it subsequently was a gateway drug and led to the use of cocaine, a heroin, and what have you. So, you know, they kind of scared us straight. But if you look at that overdose deaths in the United States, uh, little graph that we have there, opioids were 49,000 deaths, roughly, uh, alcohol, 88,000, and there were no reported medical cannabis deaths in the time period that is stated uh, for that graph. Uh, more so, we see more drugs overdose with prescription medications, you know, me basically pain medications, fentanyl. You also have obviously at the bottom right, cocaine and methamphetamines, but we're not talking about uh, illegally. So we're talking medications that we already take on a daily given basis. Uh, patients who are taking benzodiazepines like Xanax or Valium for their PTSD are more likely to get in trouble with uh, overdose, whether that's um, accidental or not, than you ever will with medical cannabis or cannabis in general. You know, we have our patients who are, are smokers. They are, they head over to Colorado and they get and they get their supply and they come back, they drive back. But they all swear by the use of medical cannabis for their symptoms. They, the grand majority are gonna tell you it, it helps them. It relieves their, their anxiety, it relieves their pain. Uh, the tremor, the anxiety that some of their Alzheimer's patients that we see get from Alzheimer's. I'm sure there's the, the family members who take it are anxious, but we never ask them. They're the ones using it, but the patients certainly benefit from it. Uh, so that being said, we we are confident. I am confident in the uh, the medication. You know what we provide in Texas is not high THC medication. So. It's easy to be able to give a senior citizen the dosing that we are able to give now via the dispensaries that Texas has, because it is not a very high THC component. So giving the patient a gummy for, let's say, Alzheimer's is not going to zonk them out. It's not going to turn them into a zombie. It's not going to get them high, if you will. <clears throat> it will help the symptoms. <clears throat> we find that by doing so, we, we avoid some of the other medications that may actually have side effects. 
So I'll give you a, a quick case study. One of our first patients that was a senior citizen that we gave medical cannabis for and prescribed it was, um, was a hospice patient who had a dementia. He had vascular dementia. And he was on roughly about six medications. Four of those were meant to control his anxiety, make sure he slept okay. And we put him on a tincture of medical cannabis and we were able to eliminate the four medications he was taking for his insomnia and anxiety. And, uh, and he was just using a tincture of medical cannabis. And, and he did that until he passed away roughly about nine months after he was admitted to our hospice. Uh, family was grateful. Interestingly enough, the only thing that, uh, that came up of it is because he grew up in a time where medical cannabis obviously was taught to be illegal. He, he, he didn't really want to know what was being given in a tincture. He, he suspected it was cannabis. It, when you have the tincture, it kind of tastes. If you ever had exposure to cannabis, it tastes like it. But, uh, but he knew that by taking it, he was, he was able to remain calm. His symptoms were relieved. And we didn't have to load him up with, you name it, a Xanax or a Trazodone or, uh, or, or something else to, to, to uh, mitigate the uh, side effects of the medications he was taking already. Let me see, I may have one more slide down below. Um, just another slide on the safe alternative that cannabis is, right? Um, we do know that uh, THC does have some well-characterized immunosuppressants. It's able to help with inflammation, let's say antispasmodic, anti-inflammatory. Uh, it has, you can find multiple research papers on the use of cannabis uh, in palliative care. It's, uh, it's being studied now more than it was in the past, essentially because is being accepted more. Uh, here in Texas, uh, going back to how you get medical cannabis uh, for a patient. <clears throat> so Texas is still pretty conservative, unlike uh, our sister state up in Oklahoma or even uh, our more liberal states like um, California or even Colorado, we're still not a recreational state. So not only do you have to qualify for medical cannabis, but you, uh, you can only get it from two dispensaries here in Texas. <clears throat> Excuse me. The dispensaries are the uh, facilities that grow the product. They purify it. They are monitored by the DPS. Uh, those two dispensaries are in Austin. There is a third license that is dormant, that is not active. So those are the dispensaries. Only two dispensaries are making the products. Uh, they come in non-smokable uh, ways of ingestion. So you're looking at capsules, gummies, lozenges, and, uh, and then tinctures, which are oils, and then creams. Recently, one of the dispensaries started making like a, like a drink, almost looks like a Gatorade. I think it's 12 ounces that has the product so you can drink it. Uh, but, but we're limited on the, uh, the ability to, to give a smokable. And the reason smokable is important like vaping is because it goes in the quickest. Right, a vape is effective, a smoke is effective because it goes into your system a lot faster than a gummy or a lozenge. Uh, but that being said, we work with what we have uh, in Texas. Hopefully, once uh, we move forward to either recreational use or we move forward with a Schedule One medical cannabis category being downgraded, you'll see you will probably see more products. Um, even if we become a recreational state medical cannabis studies show are still gonna be very much in the forefront of treatment of our patients. Um, I assure you that patients, including our seniors, do not wanna walk into a Colorado or California style dispensary with multiple, multiple products, not knowing what they can safely take. Uh, I think medical cannabis will continue to be um, uh, strong here in Texas, even if we ever become recreational just because patients want to be able to take something that is going to be effective in their symptoms, but they're not there to get a high, right? They're, getting, they're there to, to relieve their anxiety or their pain or their, or their chronic disorder. They're not necessarily there to recreationally use cannabis. But going back to Texas, uh, the way it works is that uh, Texas has a, uh, the CURT system, the Compassionate Use Registry. A physician has to be registered with that program. Uh, most of the docs that you see on that registry are going to be uh, internists. Uh, you're going to see a lot of neurologists because of the epilepsy history. You're going to see some oncologists. Uh, and then you're going to see some hospice physicians and palliative care physicians like myself. 
So if you were a patient, you were asking your PCP, listen, I, I heard that my father has Alzheimer's. I heard he can take medical cannabis for Alzheimer's. The first step would be to find if the PCP is not one of the, the physician in the registry, which by the way, I think right now it's about 300 doctors in Texas. I would have to see how many are in here in Houston in the Kitty area, but I would probably venture to say maybe about 20. So more than likely, these, these patients are not going to have a PCP that's registered. So they get referred to a physician like myself in our medical clinic, Canamed Rx, who is registered with the state. We make that uh, appointment. We see him like any other patient. Right? Our job is not to diagnose, our job is to treat. So a patient will already come to us with um, the diagnosis that you want some medical cannabis for. And then we talk to them about the medication. We talk to them how it affects the medicines they're already on. We talk to them about the potential side effects. And then we subsequently prescribe. Patient then talks to the dispensary, because once again, there's only two in the state. The dispensary is able to organize delivery or pickup. There's about four pickup spots for one of them that we use called Good Blend. And then the patient has a follow-up appointment for, with us in order to gauge their response to the medical cannabis. Uh, we find that the grand majority of patients um, do well on it. Many of them are going to report some or all alleviation of their symptoms. But to be fair, some of our patients who are already using cannabis illegally <clears throat> because they're so used to the high concentration of THC in that product are probably not going to benefit with what we give them because the cannabis that we use in the state of Texas still has a lower THC than if you were to smoke it. So I'll give an example. So um, nowadays when these dispensaries out in Colorado, for example, grow cannabis, that plant can have up to 33% THC. That's a whole lot of THC. Uh, that's the obviously the psychoactive component of, of the marijuana leaf, right? Of the marijuana plant, forgive me. When we give a medical cannabis, we are giving doses that are much lower than that. There's, we don't ever reach that level of THC. We're, we're looking at 1% by weight of the medicine you're given. So we're looking at five to 10 milligrams per dose compared to the, the many, many milligrams of THC if you were to smoke it in a recreational state like Colorado. And so that's a, it's a, it's a plus and a minus. The plus is that our senior citizens don't get zonked out, right? You give them medical cannabis, they're not going to feel like they're being drugged out of their mind. They're not going to feel like they have to sit on the couch. You know, they're not going to be that um, that uh, stereotypical sit on the couch, do nothing, get the get the uh, what is it the uh, the urge to eat. Uh, it's it's gonna they're gonna be able to to actually participate in their activities of daily living. Uh, once they are prescribed, once they reach the uh, dispensary, they get the product. And like I say, we follow up roughly in about 30 days. And then after the 30 day, we, we, we discuss whether or not they need a higher dose, smaller dose, different vector, whether they want to go from gummies to tinctures, and whether or not they want to continue. We found that some patients, like I said, who have already used heavy cannabis, they don't have an effect with the medical cannabis being made, but they certainly are going to have uh, some effect if they are cannabis naive, as we would like to call it. Um, let me take a look. Let me show you real quick the uh, the website for the the medical cannabis clinic. Uh, this uh, clinic opened in 2019. Well, 2019 is when we, we we put it into effect. 2020, 2019, we put it into consideration. We opened it opened it in September 2020. And now it's active now in 2021. Uh, we've grown increasingly busy because of the PTSD and the uh, all cancers. Uh, patients who don't have a primary care doctor who can prescribe, we're certainly welcome their business. They, we would love to take care of them. We presently have four doctors who are prescribing. Uh, essentially, they go to the website. And then when you want to get your prescription, they are you know, prompted to enter their I'm sorry, their medical history, their information. And subsequently, we reach out to them. One of our staff reaches out to them in order to provide the medical cannabis. Basic information on the website, it's relevant to uh, every medical cannabis clinic. We put only the information that the state obviously is, is allowing us to put on there. We don't make any promises. We don't extrapolate. We want to follow the law. Uh, for example, you know, if a patient comes on and asks about his meat, Medical cannabis is legal in Texas. 
obviously we very simply tell them that yes, it is for certain patients with qualifying conditions. All right, let's go back to that main. Oh, I'm sorry. And to, to show you the, and they do, they do have a list of the diagnoses. Many patients are questioning whether or not they need a certain diagnosis to meet. We tell them yes. We put the top ones on the far uh, out here on the right hand side. And if you click on this tab, you'll get subsequently all the other ones that I told you are most more than likely not to be seen very often in the general population. Um, a lot of these I haven't seen since medical school. And I don't really think I'm ever going to have a patient with prion disease asking for medical cannabis, but it's there. Uh, God forbid anybody ever have that awful disorder. I right, just go back here. Uh, and I'm trying to see what uh, I'm, if I, Catherine, do you by chance have my, um, my three points that I was looking for that email in regards to the three points we were trying to cover during the talk in regards to medical cannabis? I know we talked about the qualifying conditions. I know we talked about uh, how to get medical cannabis. Um, trying to see if it was a third, the third point that I put, I, I'm drawing a blank. I think the third point, Dr. Machado, was just you know all the different uh, reasons that you can get medical cannabis. Yeah, it's a you know once again going back in, in Texas, the the the, the diagnoses are going to be there on the. Uh, on our website as well as the uh, the state system website, uh, some of the patients are going to ask and do ask, well, what happens if I get pulled over? What happens if I'm in an or airport and I have this medical cannabis with me? Um, getting pulled over, truth be told, uh, the DPS should be aware and training their employees regarding medical cannabis. Uh, there is a phone number that uh, DPS employees, including law enforcement, can call and they can ask if a patient is on the registry. That's happened once before, a young lady who had PTSD was very concerned because she got pulled over, had her medication with her, uh, she was getting in trouble. But I subsequently told her, tell that your DPS, uh, the officer or whoever represents you to pull up the system and they'll be able to see you in the system and as a registered uh, user of medical cannabis. Um, here in Texas, we do not have a medical cannabis card. So one of the things that, um, we see a lot of his questions on the medical part. Hey doc, where's my cannabis card? Uh, California was the one that first ended up having a medical card system. Here in Texas, you don't need a medical card. Uh, in Texas, you need um, just a qualifying physician. And it used to be two, not one, to prescribe it for you. Uh, so no medical card is needed. You can carry it in, within the state. Uh, we cannot guarantee the laws of other states. So if you end up taking the medical cannabis to, let's say, your neighbor, Louisiana, or the other way to New Mexico, <clears throat> you will and may get into trouble with medical cannabis. So we tell our patients, don't take it across state lines. As long as you're in our state borders here in Texas, you should be, you should be fine. You should be safe. Um, I noticed that somebody put in the... Um, the chat, uh, the dementia, yeah. So yeah, the dementia has to be very specific. If you look up there, it says Alzheimer's dementia, Lewy body dementia. And then with the longer list that I showed you down below, you'll see some other dementias on here, including vascular dementia, if I'm not mistaken. But dementia definitely qualifies. Any dementia that is progressive should qualify a patient, right? Um, Lewy body is one of them, vascular is one of them, Alzheimer's obviously is one of them, Parkinson's dementia is one of them. So definitely we're using medical cannabis in the treatment of dementia in our practice and in our hospice. Um, other than that, um, I, I'm, I'm going gonna to end it there. I just want to kind of give you guys a quick primer. I know there's a lot of questions.